like to thank you for taking the time to join me on this week's video. On this week's video, we're concluding part three of our three-part series on workers' compensation and QME administrative issues. Administrative issues. And if you recall, in video one of this series, we discussed uh, substantial medical evidence. And then in video number two, we tackled the tough and often controversial topic of symptom magnification and malingering. And I want to continue today along the same vein in discussing uh, topics that are of profound importance to us as qualified medical evaluators, but topics that are sometimes uh, seldom discussed or seldom openly discussed, seldom openly and honestly uh, and candidly discussed. And today I want to talk to you about one of those uh, sometimes sensitive issues uh, that for whatever reason does not seem to get very much press or airtime uh, in the QME circles and in the QME uh, seminars, teachings, and writings. And what I want to talk to you today about has to deal with sub rosa videotaping. Sub rosa videotaping. And if you've been doing qualified medical evaluations for any length of time, uh, you have probably been requested to review sub rosa videotaping and to provide your comments in the form of a supplemental report and specifically to state whether the findings or I should say your observations uh, of the sub rosa videotaping cause you in any way to change or modify the opinions of your uh, permanent and stationary report. And uh, I've done some research on sub rosa videotaping and I want you to know that uh, in my career as a qualified medical evaluator, almost now 20 years, I uh, got my QME credential in 1995, so almost 20 years, uh, I've been able to find very little written on the topic of sub rosa videotaping. It seems that there's just not much material or not much information available uh, about this important topic. So for today, uh, I want to discuss some of the issues that relate to sub rosa videotaping and specifically I want to conclude this program with a discussion as to how we as qualified medical evaluators uh, can handle sub rosa videotaping when we're presented with it. In other words, I want to establish a procedure and a protocol that we can follow uh, collectively as a group when we're presented uh, with sub rosa videotaping. In other words, I want to establish a procedure as to how to handle it. And uh, I believe this to be important because nowhere is such a procedure uh, published. So this is material that you're not going to find uh, anywhere else. This is totally unique uh, discussion that uh, you can only get, uh, as far as I know, <laughs> right here. Okay? So let's talk a little bit about sub rosa videotaping. Sometimes you'll hear the term uh, sub rosa without the word videotaping. For example, uh, one of the parties may say that uh, I think we need to get some sub rosa. Or they may say that, uh, yeah, have you had a chance to view the sub rosa? Or terms like that. Well, sub rosa comes from the Greek meaning under the rose. Sub rosa. Rose, here's the rose. This is under the rose. Sub rosa means under the rose. Well, rose, the, the symbol of rose, of the rose, goes back to uh, Roman and even Greek mythology to symbolize uh, silence and secrecy. So sub rosa literally means uh, in silence and in secrecy. And back in the Greek and Roman days, uh, as a symbol of silence and secrecy, they would uh, be known to take a rose and hang it upside down uh, over the doorway of meeting rooms, hall rooms, chambers, boardrooms, meeting rooms, etc. And so that when you pass through the doorway and you passed underneath the rose, sub rosa, <laughs> you were sworn to silence and you were sworn to secrecy as to the proceedings that transpired within the chamber. Well, Similarly, today, sub rosa videotaping is videotaping, is the 
uh, obtaining of visual images, and that's what Sub Rosa video taming, taping is. It's simply the obtaining of visual images that is silent and secret from the examinee. It's secret and unknown only to the examinee. <laughs> and so, Sub Rosa video taping is the attempt to obtain visual images, the purpose of which is to prove a lie or to disprove the statements of the applicant or injured worker. And for purposes of this video, I'm going to use synonymously the term uh, examinee, applicant, and injured worker. In fact, for us as qualified medical evaluators, it's probably most accurate to refer to these persons as the examinee. So the purpose of Sub Rosa videotaping is the attempt from the claims examiner to disprove a lie, to disprove the statements of the examinee. And we'll talk about why it is that uh, certain cases spark the ordering of Sub Rosa videotaping and certain cases, uh, for whatever reason, do not spark the, video, uh, the obtaining of Sub Rosa videotaping. And if you've been doing qualified medical evaluations for any length of time, You've probably had cases that you reviewed where you uh, thought to yourself, well, my goodness, I think they should get some Sub Rosa videotaping on this case. <laughs> and yet, for whatever reason, they don't. Well, we'll talk about what are the case factors and the case details that uh, push claims examiners over the edge and uh, cause them to actually order Sub Rosa videotaping. So in today's video, I want to go over uh, a couple key issues. And as I said, uh, there's not much written on the topic of Sub Rosa videotaping. As an example, uh, I don't know if you have this book or not. This is the 2015 edition of the Workers' Compensation Laws of California. It's brand new. Uh, has some edits and updates even above and beyond the 2014 edition. But I searched this entire book. I have this book in electronic format. And I searched this entire book using the search terms Sub Rosa, Rosa, uh, videotaping, and believe it or not, there's very little written here about Sub Rosa videotaping. So I want to share with you uh, what I've been able to learn. Now, I want to provide a disclaimer uh, before we get into today's topics, and that is, uh, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> I'm a qualified medical evaluator. And I'm a chiropractor by license. I'm not a lawyer. But <laughs> I'm going to go over some labor codes and some regulations and a couple of excerpts from California Civil Codes. And I'm going to give you my best interpretation uh, of those codes with the disclaimer that uh, I really have no background uh, training in laws or in anything legal, but we do have the references and I want to share with you uh, word for word what some of these references have to say when it comes to Sub Rosa videotaping. So some of the important topics uh, that I want to share with you today uh, include the following. We're going to talk about the purpose and the concerns of the claims administrator that caused the claims administrator to uh, go ahead and order Sub Rosa videotaping. As we're going to talk about here in a few minutes, uh, Sub Rosa videotaping is very difficult and it's very expensive. And for that reason, uh, not every case that would seemingly qualify for Sub Rosa videotaping actually uh, undergoes videotaping. It's only a very few select cases that are chosen for Sub Rosa videotaping. And I'll explain to you in those cases what is the purpose of the Sub Rosa videotaping and what are the concerns of the claims administrator that actually push them over to the edge and make them decide to invest the time, the effort, and the money to obtain uh, this, these expensive visual images. Once we get that handled, I'm going to talk about uh, the editing and the admissibility of Sub Rosa videotaping. In other words, once we finally have some Sub Rosa videotaping, uh, how do we as qualified medical evaluators consider what we see in the form of these uh, visual images? 
We'll talk about how these images can be edited. And then we'll talk about the admissibility uh, of this evidence uh, in the workers' compensation setting. And as we'll see, uh, not all sub rosa videotaping actually qualifies uh, as evidence that's admissible. In fact, uh, some videotaping, no matter what it shows on the videotaping, and let me give you an example. Uh, let's say you have an injured worker who says they can't do anything. <laughs> and uh, we come up with some sub rosa videotaping that shows them uh, to be doing uh, two-story jumps on their wakeboard. <laughs> visual images that are clearly uh, contradictory to the examinee's claim statements uh, does not necessarily mean that that evidence, even though it's contrary and it proves the lie, does not necessarily mean that that evidence is admissible in workers' compensation. And we'll talk about uh, some of those issues. And then finally, I want to get to the punchline of today's video, and that is I want to talk to you about what is the obligation of the qualified medical evaluator when you look at sub rosa videotaping? Now, it's said that man is a visual creature. And sometimes when we get this sub rosa videotaping uh, that shows the examinee uh, in secrecy, unbeknownst to the examinee, we sort of have this feeling that we're peering in on them secretly onto their, into their private life. And that anything that they do in this secret videotaping uh, is incriminating to them. And uh, after reviewing hundreds and hundreds of sub rosa videotapes, uh, I've decided that that's not necessarily true. I've come to realize that uh, we need to take everything in context. And I want to establish a procedure for us that, as far as I know, uh, is going to be the only established procedure that's ever been written or published uh, on this subject. And so I want to talk to you about a step-by-step -step procedure that you can use to uh, prepare your supplemental report after you've had a chance to view Sub Rosa videotaping. So I have a fascinating program for you here today. It's going to be full of content that uh, is brand new and that you've uh, probably never heard before and you cannot get anywhere else. And so uh, I look forward to being back with you in just a moment and we'll tackle uh, some of these sensitive and delicate issues related to Sub Rosa videotaping. So let's begin. So let's imagine this. You receive on your desk one day uh, a package uh, from the U.S. mail and you open it up and it contains uh, some DVD discs that uh, have your most recent examinee's name on, on top of the discs. <laughs> and you realize that these are Sub Rosa videotapes of a case that you recently examined. Uh, the question comes to your mind, why is this examinee uh, been chosen for sub rosa videotaping? Of all the hundreds of thousands of workers' compensation claims on an uh, annual basis in the state of California, how many do you think are chosen for sub rosa videotaping? Well, the percentage is actually quite small. And it's much smaller than the percentage of cases that actually qualify uh, for sub rosa videotaping. So when you get sub rosa videotaping, uh, you have to take it seriously because it indicates that the claims examiner, the person responsible for the adjustment of this claim, uh, has some concerns. And what the claims adjuster has concerns for is they have concerns for workers' compensation fraud. And so the purpose of sub rosa videotaping uh, is an attempt to prosecute claimants for filing fraudulent workers' compensation claims. In other words, the purpose of sub rosa videotaping is not simply 
uh, to question your permanent impairment rating uh, or your opinions on causation and apportionment of the permanent impairment. Although those opinions and conclusions can change uh, as a result of images that are depicted on subrosa videotaping. But the primary purpose of subrosa videotaping is to attempt to reduce workers' compensation fraud. Okay? So, uh, when you receive subrosa videotaping, it indicates that the claims examiner is concerned. It indicates that the claims examiner has reviewed the case and the claims examiner has come up with some issues uh, that cause them to have what's known as an articulable suspicion. An articulable suspicion. What an articulable suspicion is, it's a suspicion that the claims examiner can clearly put into words and can describe that cause them to suspect uh, that this may uh, in fact be a fraudulent claim. So uh, of all the cases that are filed annually, only a small percentage actually get to the point where the claims examiner uh, goes over the edge and invests the time, the effort, and the money to obtain subrosa videotaping. Because, uh, as we'll talk about here as we go, subrosa videotaping is very difficult and it's very expensive. And uh, when you order, when the claims examiner orders subrosa videotaping, they ne have no guarantee that the videotaping footage is going to be successful, that it's going to be quality footage that is going to help them uh, in their uh, proof for workers' compensation fraud. So the subrosa videotaping is not always successful. It's difficult and it's expensive. So when you actually get subrosa videotaping, uh, you need to take it seriously. So let's talk about some of the red flags that uh, cause claims administrators uh, to actually order subrosa videotaping. And what I want to share with you now uh, are some of the most common red flags of workers' compensation fraud on the side of the examinee, on the side of the injured worker. As we know, workers' compensation fraud is an ongoing investigation of all parties involved in the system, not just examinees or applicants. It also uh, involves investigations against doctors. It involves investigations against qualified medical evaluators investigations against diagnostic study providers, investigations against uh, multiple specialists. In other words, workers' compensation fraud is a large issue that involves not just the examinee, but for the purposes of this discussion, I want to talk to you about uh, the most common red flags of examinee workers' compensation fraud. And these are the issues that are going to cause the claims examiner to uh, snap, <laughs> to snap and to pull the trigger on uh, some subrosa videotaping. Okay, so let's talk about some red flags of workers' compensation fraud. Well, if I was to ask you, uh, what are some of the red flags that would cause you to believe uh, an examinee is uh, fraudulent? Well, number one red flag, A number one. <laughs> is an examinee who reports an unwitnessed incident. An unwitnessed incident. And what we're going to see is sometimes many of these red flags uh, occur in tandem uh, or they occur in multiples. So for example, uh, number one red flag is the dual situation where we have an examinee who reports an unwitnessed incident Number two, that has a delay in reporting the incident. So typically this uh, manifests itself in workers' compensation as an injured worker who presents to their supervisor on Monday morning and they report to their supervisor that two to three days earlier on Friday when they were working alone in the warehouse, uh, they suffered an injury, say perhaps an injury to the lower back. And at the time, uh, they didn't think much of it. Uh, no one was around, and they didn't report it, and they thought it would go away. And, but here they are on Monday morning uh, applying for workers' compensation benefits. So we have an unwitnessed incident with a delay in reporting. 
Now, an unwitnessed incident with a delay of reporting raises the issue as to the presence or the absence of an industrial injury. Did an injury actually occur? Did it not occur? We really don't know. The presence or absence of an industrial injury in this situation is a question of fact. It's a question of fact. It does not require a medical determination. It requires the issue to be evaluated for the facts. See, did an injury happen or not? He said it happened, but it was an unwitnessed incident that he did not report at the time, reporting it several days later. Now, as qualified medical evaluators, we do not resolve questions of fact. Questions of fact are resolved by the trier of fact. The trier of fact is the judge. So, what's our obligation as the qualified medical evaluator in these situations? Our obligation in these situations is to determine whether or not on Monday morning a bona fide medical condition exists. In other words, is there an actual medical condition? Does this examinee have positive objective findings uh, for a lumbar strain, for lumbar radiculopathy? Are there positive physical examination findings that confirm, yes indeed there is a bona fide medical condition? That's number one. And then number two, is it possible, is it possible that this bona fide medical condition, if it exists, is it possible that this is something that could have been caused by the mechanism of injury as it's described by the examinee. This raises the question of fact and it's the number one red flag in workers' compensation claims. So when the claims examiner uh, is presented with this type of claim, they check off one of the red flag boxes that tip them toward ordering uh, sub rosa videotaping if other red flags uh, are to show up, suggesting workers' compensation fraud. Okay? Um, other red flags. Um, the injured worker is a new hire. Someone uh, gets hired on the job and immediately files uh, a workers' compensation claim. It's a red flag. Um, the applicant took unexplained or excessive time off prior to the claimed injury. What would be some examples of uh, unexplained or excessive time off? Excessive time off prior to uh, a claimed injury. How about someone who uh, was off on a, another type of health disability? Perhaps they were on uh, state disability, have now come back to work, and uh, immediately file a claim for uh, workers' compensation, thereby extending their period of disability. How about someone who just comes back to work after uh, a period of time off work on maternity leave, uh, or even paternity leave? <laughs> okay, they come back to work and they file a workers' compensation claim and extend their time off work. How about somebody who uh, just had a period of time off work on uh, family medical leave or somebody who came back from an extended leave of absence and now they're filing a claim for workers' compensation, the purpose of which is to extend the time off of work. Um, another red flag is when the alleged injury uh, occurs prior to or just after a strike, a layoff, a plant closure, a job termination, uh, the completion of temporary or seasonal work, or upon notice of employer relocation. So the employer says, uh, we're moving from San Francisco to Los Angeles, and all of a sudden they get <laughs> 10 or 15 uh, claims for industrial injuries. Okay? And I don't know about you, but uh, I can't tell you how many cases I've evaluated that involve injuries uh, right upon the completion uh, of seasonal or temporary work. So another major red flag. Does that mean that every single examinee who reports an industrial injury on the conclusion of seasonal work is fraudulent? No, it doesn't. It doesn't mean that. It means that it's simply one red flag. And once the claims adjuster accumulates enough red flags 
that could be sufficient to spark them to order sub rosa videotaping. Um, the injured worker becomes employed while receiving temporary disability benefits but fails to tell anyone about it, thereby securing uh, at least two sources of income. The alleged injury relates to a pre-existing injury or a health problem. Pre-existing injury or pre-existing health problem. And this is a common occurrence uh, in workers' compensation. In fact, there's a joke in workers' compensation that says that uh, a person with a bum knee finds a way to fall out of the dumpster <laughs> while they're at work. A person with a pre-existing knee injury finds a way to stumble on the stairs or fall out of the dumpster while at work so that they can receive medical treatment for this growing concern of a pre-existing health condition. Uh, the injured worker is overly pushy and demanding for a quick settlement, for a commitment, or some form of a decision. And you may be familiar with applicants who use terms uh, or who say things to you such as, uh, I just want this to be over. Or, uh, I just want to get over this as soon as possible so that I can move on. Or phrases to that effect could be uh, an example of a red flag. Uh, the injured worker is unusually familiar with claim handling procedures, with workers' compensation rules, laws, and regulations. And uh, anytime you're faced with this type of examinee who knows more about <laughs> workers' compensation than you do, uh, that could be a red flag. Uh, the claimant was experiencing, okay, imagine this one. The claimant was experiencing financial difficulties and or domestic problems prior to the submission of the claim. Financial difficulties and domestic problems. Sometimes financial difficulties and domestic problems go hand in hand and occur simultaneously. So <laughs> what would be an example uh, of a person suffering financial difficulties and simultaneous domestic problems. What will be an example? How about an injured worker who finds that his wages uh, are going to be garnished in order to pay back child support payments? How about an injured worker who discovers that his wages are going to be garnished in order to pay for health insurance benefits for the kids who are living with the mom in a separate location? See, these type of things happen. And in this case, the injured worker may uh, discover these financial obligations and realize that they're not going to be able to comply uh, with this financial burden. Or they may review these expenses and realize that these expenses would simply crush them. And they start looking for uh, an alternative in the form of a workers' compensation claim. So be on the lookout for examinees who have financial problems and or uh, domestic disputes or domestic problems. And it's interesting because many of these red flags that we're talking about here today, these are uh, issues that you can elucidate in your history taking and in your interview uh, with the examinee. Many of these are questions that you can uh, seamlessly integrate into your interview procedure with the examinee uh, to come up with these answers. And these answers uh, provide valuable information for you later on when it comes time for you uh, to do your physical examination and also to provide your opinions on permanent impairment, causation of por apportionment, and all the other uh, issues. Okay, a couple more. Um, the claimant indulges in high-risk activities such as skydiving uh, and or bungee jumping. <laughs> now, those are certainly high-risk activities, but what about uh, examinees who participate in other activities, such as uh, weight training? 
What about an examinee who presents with a lower back injury or a knee injury and you discover that they are uh, a weight training enthusiast? Or what about the examinee who is on the men's softball league or is on the men's hockey league or is on the women's volleyball team? Or what about the examinee who enjoys uh, competitive downhill mountain bike racing? Okay. So these outside activities are something that you would want to explore uh, in your interview and in your history taking. How about the uh, examinee who, whose version of the accident has inconsistencies, ha is not credible, or is different from witness statements or statements of co-workers? So the examinee's description of the injury or accident is different from the statement of witnesses or co-workers. And this is interesting. This is interesting. I want you to think back about uh, the number of cases that you've evaluated in your career, however long your uh, career may be. Think about all the cases that you've reviewed. Of all those cases that you've reviewed, how many of those cases come with statements from either witnesses or co-workers. It's quite small. I'm thinking about my own cases over the past 20 years, uh, which is over 1,500 cases. And of all those cases, uh, I can remember a small percentage, couple handfuls, that included statements from either witnesses or co-workers that contradicted the statements of the injured worker. So let's think about this. What would cause a witness or a coworker to provide in writing, to document in perpetuity, a statement describing the incident of injury? This is a real attention getter and you need to take this seriously. So for example, imagine, uh, imagine a supervisor outside at a construction site uh, standing there talking when all of a sudden uh, one of the co-workers falls down from a scaffold onto the ground right next to the supervisor. <laughs> they witnessed specific incident. That supervisor does not then provide statements, written statements that say uh, the guy didn't fall. <laughs> this is an undisputed injury. Okay? So when you get written statements from witnesses or co-workers that contradict the statements of the examinee, what does that tell you? That tells you that this person is motivated, that this person is compelled, that this person is driven to get their story into the record for all to see forever and ever. It's a real attention getter and it's a red flag. It's a red flag. It's a major red flag. A uh, couple more. Uh, the claimant fails to keep scheduled appointments and is generally uncooperative. And I know that this scenario uh, is a particular burn to claims examiners. It's a particular burn. And it's the claims examiners that get first win of missed and canceled appointments and they get first win of any indication that the examinee may be generally uncooperative. See, because the claims examiner uh, is receiving the doctor's billings, is receiving the doctor's, uh, the treating doctor's billings and the treating doctor's reports. And so the claims examiner has the opportunity to see the case unfolding uh, in real time as it's happening. Whereas we as qualified medical evaluators, uh, we get sort of a post haste uh, summary of the case long after the events have actually occurred. But the claims examiner sees this happen in real time and when they see a general pattern of uh, lack of cooperation or an examinee who is missing their treatment appointments, it's a red flag. It's a red flag. And let's talk about this for a minute. Why is it a red flag? Why is it a red flag? Why is an examinee who fails to keep their scheduled appointments or who is generally uncooperative with the treatment program, why is that a red flag? 
Well, in my opinion, <laughs> it's a red flag because there's this general perception that people who are having problems with their health, people who are in pain, people who are struggling, people who are having issues medically, seek medical care. They go to doctor's appointments. They don't miss appointments. They attend treatment programs. They attend physical therapy. They attend chiropractic treatment sessions. They follow the program. People who are in pain, people who have bona fide medical conditions that are a concern, go to the doctor. They're seeking a solution to their problem in a bona fide case, and for that, they go to the doctor. And let me give you an example of this from my own personal experience. <laughs> and this is going to seem like kind of a trite example, uh, but it illustrates this as a principle. And I want to tell you a story about foot pain. <laughs> I myself, up until about two days ago, and this is a true story, up until about two, two days ago, uh, I had some pain in my left foot that I would describe as exquisite pain. And I can use that term because this is a, uh, being seen by doctors all, all over the state and all over the country. And doctors are familiar with the term exquisite pain. I had pain in my left foot that I would describe as exquisite pain. <laughs> it was very painful, okay? Now, the pain was located right about at the mid shaft of the fourth metatarsal bone. It was sort of hidden under the arch of my foot in a non-weight bearing portion of my foot. And so to walk and bear weight uh, was not a lot of pain. In fact, there was really no pain in the beginning. But if you touch the area of the lesion, and there was something there, I couldn't tell what it was, but if you touch it, there was exquisite pain. I'm, tell I'm talking very light touch like this was like, ah, oh, what is that? Ah, that hurts. It was exquisitely painful. Well, after about a week, two weeks, and three weeks, the size of this lesion started to expand. And I started to notice pain in my foot now on weight bearing and walking. And it got to the point where uh, I was having to limit my walking. And I could see that in a couple days, uh, I would not be able to walk. And I could see that this was going nowhere good. <laughs> so, uh, reluctantly, uh, I scheduled an appointment with my primary care medical doctor. My primary care medical doctor. Now, for those of you that know me, you know that I'm a chiropractor. <laughs> and if you know anything about chiropractors, uh, most chiropractors don't use a lot of medical services because philosophically in chiropractic, we believe that uh, a large majority, or a large bulk of uh, painful conditions can be handled uh, with chiropractic treatment. <laughs> and for some chiropractors, uh, chiropractic treatment is their main form of health care and they don't seek a lot of medical services. And I don't use a lot of medical services. <laughs> well, that's all great. <laughs> Until you get to the point where you have some sort of condition that cannot be handled by chiropractic. In other words, I couldn't think of any chiropractic treatment that could resolve this condition on my foot. And as I looked at my foot and examined my own foot, uh, I had no idea what it was. I thought that maybe perhaps it was sort of a subsurface uh, plantar wart and there was a little tiny discoloration there, but there was really nothing visible. There was no outward objective signs. There was no signs of inflammation. And I didn't know what it was. I thought maybe I could have had a March fracture of one of the metatarsal bones. I didn't know, but I knew it was worsening. And so I scheduled an appointment with my primary care medical physician. And they told me to be there for 9.15. Well, I showed up at 9.05. I was eager. I was anxious. I was 
interested to find out what the heck is going on and what can we do about it. And I showed up at the appointment because I was motivated. Even me, I don't like going to the medical doctor and I don't like using medical services. But I had a condition, a bona fide medical painful condition that required treatment and I attended my treatment appointment. Well, the doctor took a look at it and he shone the light on it and he identified uh, a metal sliver that had somehow uh, oriented itself vertically into the substance of uh, the, the sole of my foot and he pulled it out of there and long story short, I was cured. <laughs> but the purpose of this story is to tell you that people who have bona fide medical conditions they go for their appointments. They don't miss appointments. They cooperate with the treatment program. When you have an examinee who's missing appointments, canceling appointments, showing up late for the appointments, aborting the appointments, not cooperating with the treatment program, it's a red flag. And it really burns the claims examiner because they're paying for ongoing care for what they perceive to be an unmotivated examinee. So, you may look through the medical records of your uh, QME cases and look for patterns of missed appointments, skipped appointments, lack of cooperation with the treatment program. Let's talk about lack of cooperation for a minute. How does lack of cooperation manifest itself uh, in the uh, examinee's history? How about an examinee who uh, attends only uh, a fraction of the treatment program? Say, for example, the examinee is scheduled for uh, eight physical therapy sessions and says that uh, after the first or second or third session that the therapy is making them worse and they discontinue the therapy. And then they try uh, chiropractic treatment and uh, after one or two sessions they conclude that the chiropractic treatment uh, is making them worse and they conclude the chiropractic treatment or the examinee goes for massage treatment or acupuncture treatment and does not complete the recommended treatment series. This is a red flag. See, these treatments, the physical therapy, the chiropractic, the massage, acupuncture, all these treatments, the medications that are prescribed, these are treatments that are designed to help the examinee to feel better, to get better. It's a red flag when the examinee says that these treatments made them worse. I don't know about you, but I'm a chiropractor. And after doing chiropractic for uh, almost 30 years, the number of people who say that the chiropractic treatment uh, did not help them or made them worse is extremely small. <laughs> it's very small. There are a few, but it's the exception, not the rule. And when you have an examinee who claims that none of the treatment modalities are helping and they abort all the treatment modalities, it's a red flag. An examinee who does not take their medication because of claimed side effects is a red flag. An examinee who has their medications changed and finds those medications intolerable, it's a red flag. Does that mean that their medications could possibly be intolerable? Yeah, they possibly could be. But when you see this pattern, it's an eyebrow raiser and it's an attention getter. And it really chaps the hide of the claims examiners who I've had an opportunity to speak to. So that's one thing that I encourage you to look for in your review of medical records and in your interview with the injured worker is, is there a pattern of canceled or missed appointments or a pattern of general lack of cooperation? Okay? A couple more and then we'll uh, move on. How about an examinee uh, who has a lifestyle that is not consistent with their reported known income. How about an examinee who has family members who are also receiving either workers' compensation, unemployment, social security, welfare, disability insurance, veterans administration benefits. In fact, sometimes these uh, examinees, the entire family is on some form uh, of compensation assistance outside of work. And so this is something that you could elucidate uh, in the social history of your interview. Uh, new or additional medical problems are alleged. 
and attributed to the original injury. This is called false attribution, false attribution. When new or additional medical problems arise and the examinee attributes those problems to the original industrial injury, this is false attribution. And then finally, uh, claimant's co-workers advise that the injury is not legitimate or that the injury did not occur at work. And this is something that you really need to pay serious attention to when you get these uh, witness or co-worker statements. Okay, so those are some of the red flags that suggest uh, injured worker or applicant fraud. And as I said earlier, uh, workers' compensation fraud investigations are ongoing. Uh, and are targeted at doctors, are targeted at uh, cappers, are targeted at diagnostic study providers, etc. And so uh, I want to talk about one more red flag that involves both uh, examinees and uh, primary treating physicians. And that is when the claimant lives a long distance from the medical facility but receives frequent treatment. They live a long distance from the medical facility and yet they're receiving frequent treatment. And the reason they're going to this medical facility is because they want to go to a specific medical facility despite the fact that it's a uh, considerable distance from where they live. And so uh, as an example, you have an examinee who lives in City A and the medical facility is in City B and those two are separated by an hour, two hours, three hours of drive time one way. And I had an examinee myself one time who lived in City A and was receiving treatment in City B three days per week and the one way trip between those two was almost three and a half hours. So this examinee had to leave his house at like 8 a.m. in order to be on time for a near noon appointment and he would receive a near noon physical therapy appointment which lasted for about 30 minutes and then the examinee would drive then three and a half or even four hours in traffic to get back home and you can see that this is about an eight hour round trip for a 30 minute uh, treatment. How are they going to get better uh, doing that and so uh, that's a red flag. That's a red flag because in traveling three and a half hours they of course pass probably hundreds and hundreds of clinics that could provide the same level of service without the cost, expense, time and inconvenience of having to travel uh, three and a half hours one way. Okay? So uh, as I said, uh, workers' compensation fraud investigations are ongoing and uh, as qualified medical evaluators and primary treating physicians, we need to be aware of some of the red flags that uh, claims administrators uh, are looking at and we need to be aware of these red flags as well. And uh, I want you to know that uh, many times, uh, and you can read about these uh, all over the internet, all you have to do is type in workers' compensation fraud investigations and up will come uh, more material <laughs> than you ever thought existed. But workers' compensation fraud investigations are ongoing. And one of the uh, methods that are used by workers' compensation investigators, investigators to investigate primary treating physician doctors and qualified medical evaluators is to establish a phony claim and bring the phony claim into the evaluator and see if the evaluator uh, will pick up on any of the red flags. And so what the investigator will do is they'll uh, fabricate a case history that includes several of the red flags that we just discussed. So for example, the uh, phony claimant will go into a doctor's office and they'll say uh, that I, I had an unwitnessed injury <laughs> they won't use the word unwitnessed, but they'll say, yeah, I was injured at work. Uh, everybody had gone home and I was there uh, mopping by myself. And uh, I didn't think much of it. And a couple weeks went by and I reported it. And uh, I've been seeing the doctor. I go to a clinic. 
uh, in Reading, but I live in San Francisco. In other words, they install several of the red flags to see if anyone uh, will be suspicious about this claim and will treat this claim with the level of suspicion that it presents with. And I've had uh, some of these cases myself. And whenever I smell one of these red flags, uh, it really uh, is an attention getter. And it really causes me to be especially careful, especially careful about every single step uh, of my physical examination, and every single opinion and conclusion that I offer. So uh, I hope this helps you become more aware uh, of some of the red flags. Okay? Okay, so let's uh, talk about this now. So the claims examiner uh, finally cracks and they order sub rosa videotaping. Well, what happens next? Well, as we said, uh, sub rosa videotaping is difficult and it's expensive. And uh, many times uh, the quality of the footage that you receive uh, is not great. And the quality of the footage and the images depicted in the footage uh, don't really portray uh, the examinee to be doing anything incriminating. Well, as we know, uh, any videotaping, including the videotaping of me that you're watching, <laughs> can be edited. It can be edited. It can be edited basically to portray or depict uh, just about anything that uh, a person wants. And so, for example, when you receive sub rosa videotaping, you need to kind of take the sub rosa videotaping with a grain of salt, recognizing and understanding that it's possible that this videotaping uh, could have been edited and likely uh, has been edited. And you should look through the videotaping and see if indeed there are gaps in the time periods that suggest that indeed this videotaping uh, has been edited. And uh, let me tell you a story from uh, my practice, from my own experience, uh, that indicates this. Uh, I once uh, provided uh, for high level of permanent impairment for an examinee. And the permanent impairment included consideration, or I should say included a rating, for permanent impairment due to gait disturbance due to part-time use of a cane. Part-time use of a cane. So this examinee came to the examination. They came with a cane. And he told me that uh, in and around the house, uh, he does not use the cane. Uh, but when he goes outside the house, uh, he has to use the cane. He needs the cane for balance and for uh, some weight-bearing relief. So, I provided for permanent impairment in part due to gait disturbance due to part-time use of a cane. Well, shortly after I issued my report, I received some sub rosa videotaping that contained hours and hours and hours of footage, none of which depicted the examinee to use the cane. Nowhere in any of this footage over several days and several hours of him up on his feet and walking around was he seen to be using a cane. So when I viewed this videotaping, I prepared a supplemental report that simply stated that uh, <laughs> in between the time I saw him for the QME exam and the date of the sub rosa videotaping, he had improved. <laughs> he had improved to the point where he no longer, apparently, uh, required even part-time use of a cane. <laughs> well, shortly thereafter, I received some correspondence from the applicant attorney that uh, suggested that the videotaping had been edited and the images wherein the examinee was depicted to be using a cane were clearly edited out of the footage. In fact, uh, the judge in this case had an opportunity to review the entire unedited videotaping. And the judge demanded that the entire unedited, unedited,
videotape be sent to me so that I could indeed witness the examinee to be using his cane. And the judge indicated in his statement, uh, please review uh, minute 42 on day two wherein the examinee is depicted to use the cane. And so then I received a second set of videotapes and I reviewed those and there was no cane. <laughs> no cane. And I wrote back and I said, where's the cane? There's no cane. And they sent me another set of videotapes that they assured me uh, was the uh, complete unedited version of the videotaping and there was no cane. And so this went back and forth and back and forth and, and I never did get this case resolved. I have no idea how it resolved, but I was never provided with videotaping that depicted the examinee to use his cane, even though the judge himself witnessed the videotaping, viewed the videotaping, made notes about the videotaping, and demanded that the videotaping be sent to me for my review and comment. So these videotapes are merely sequences and sections in time that we need to take into context, into the overall context of the case, the case history, physical exam, and everything. And we need to realize that these videotapes uh, can be edited to portray almost anything uh, that the party uh, wants to portray. Okay? Now, another thing about uh, Sub Rosa videotaping is that uh, sometimes the admissibility of Sub Rosa videotaping is called into question, and not every single Sub Rosa videotape that is obtained uh, is admissible evidence in workers' compensation. And uh, I want to talk about uh, a couple of issues relating to the admissibility of Sub Rosa videotaping. Now, for the most part, Sub Rosa videotaping if it's obtained properly, uh, will be admitted into uh, evidence and can be provided to the qualified medical evaluator. And uh, I want to talk to you about a, a bona fide case that made its way uh, to the Workers' Compensation Appeals Board and was reconsidered twice, reconsidered twice as to the admissibility of the Sub Rosa videotaping. Okay? So I want to talk to you about Civil Code Section 1708.8. 1708.8. This deals with physical and constructive invasion of privacy. Invasion of privacy. And if Sub Rosa videotaping can be demonstrated to have substantially invaded the privacy of the examinee, that Sub Rosa videotaping can be excluded from the medical record if invasion of privacy uh, can be proven. So uh, this is known as the anti-paparazzi statute, Civil Code Section 1708.8. Now this deals with civil code, it doesn't deal with workers' compensation uh, rules and regulations, but this code can be invoked if it can be demonstrated that the examinee's privacy was invaded uh, by the investigator. So let me read just a couple of key sections uh, from this civil code. And remember, uh, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm going to read word for word uh, from this and give you my best uh, interpretation of this code. Okay, it says, a person is liable for physical invasion of privacy when the person knowingly enters onto the land of another person without permission or otherwise committed a trespass in order to, number one, capture any type of visual image, sound recording, or other physical impression of the plaintiff engaging in a private, personal, or familial activity. Private, personal, or familial activity. That's a key phrase. We'll elaborate on that in just a minute. And, number two, the invasion occurs in a manner that is offensive to a reasonable person. Okay? So let's define private, personal, and familial activities. For the purposes of this section, private, personal, and familial activity includes, but is not limited to, number one, intimate details of the plaintiff's personal life, 
under circumstances in which the plaintiff has a reasonable expectation of privacy. A reasonable expectation of privacy. Number two, interaction with the plaintiff's family or significant others, maybe like at a party. Under circumstances in which the plaintiff has a reasonable expectation of privacy. Number three, other aspects of the plaintiff's private affairs or concerns under circumstances in which the plaintiff has a reasonable expectation of privacy. shocked. I was shocked to see the examinee to be able to perform activities that I stated in my report uh, that they could not do. And uh, after this uh, embarrassingly happened to me a couple of dozen times, uh, I vowed that from that point forward uh, I would not be fooled by injured workers subjectivity uh, in the future. And I don't know if this has happened to you or not, uh, but imagine your chagrin to view Sub Rosa videotaping uh, that depicts the examinee doing things and physical activities that uh, just a short time before uh, they indicated to you in your qualified medical evaluation that they could not do, and indeed they had uh, what appeared to be significant positive objective findings to substantiate those statements. It's quite uh, embarrassing and when this happened to me uh, each time uh, for about a couple of dozen times <laughs> uh, I was always embarrassed and I felt foolish and I vowed that this would not happen again. So when you're presented with Sub Rosa videotaping uh, many times the, uh, uh, your opinions and conclusions that you previously offered uh, may not change as a result of the Sub Rosa videotaping. In fact, I want to encourage you to focus from this point forward on the truly objective findings and the truly objective factors in the case and try to uh, downplay or diminish the importance of the subjective findings and subjective factors of the case. And this is consistent with the philosophy of the AMA guides, which as you know is largely focused on the objective findings, objective facts, objective tests, objective measures, objective facts. Now the AMA guides do provide for uh, permanent impairment due to subjective complaints and of pain in chapter 18, but by and large, the AMA guides are focused largely on the objective findings and the objective facts. So if you provide your permanent impairment rating very closely according to the objective findings or facts in a case, uh, your permanent impairment rating and your conclusions on causation and apportionment and all those things uh, likely may not change as a result uh, of the Sub Rosa videotaping. In fact, I recently viewed some Sub Rosa videotaping that showed the examinee to be doing all kinds of physical activity uh, and it didn't cause me to change my permanent impairment rating because my permanent impairment rating was solely based uh, on the objective facts of the case. And it really wouldn't have mattered if I'd have seen the, the uh, examinee uh, racing motocross or doing backflips or uh, jumping off of uh, tall buildings in a single bound, it really wouldn't have mattered because my permanent impairment rating was set up simply according to the objective findings in the case. And so when you first view the Sub Rosa videotaping, you want to first ask yourself, how is this videotaping, if at all, if at all, how is this going to cause me to modify or alter my opinion and conclusions uh, in any way? And if you're conservative at the beginning, 
and not sticking your neck out with a high permanent impairment rating based on subjective factors, uh, there's a good chance your, per your opinions and conclusions may not change. Okay, and so here's a couple of uh, procedures that I want to recommend to you that uh, you can adopt as your own the next time you get some Subrosa videotaping. Number one is to determine if the visual evidence is in accordance with or does it contradict any of the medical history. And as I said, uh, we need to kind of take Subrosa videotaping with a grain of salt. In other words, if you have an examinee that has some permanent impairment, you need to think to yourself, well, how is this permanent impairment affecting this person in their daily living activities? You know, we, we should not expect these people to be dead. They can still have some level of function. They can still walk. They can still do things. They can still go shopping. They can still carry on. And so just because we see the examinee uh, doing physical activities, those physical activities may be well within what we would consider to be normal range of uh, function for somebody who has uh, this permanent impairment. So first of all, determine if the activity is consistent with the permanent impairment or is uh, contradictory uh, with the permanent impairment. And let me give you an example. Uh, in the uh, spine chapter of chapter 15, the range of motion table, table 15.8, provides for permanent impairment for those examinees who have had spinal fusion. That's uh, in section four, I think, section D and section E. Well, spinal fusion is an objective fact of the case. Well, you may view sub rows of videotaping that shows your examinee to be doing uh, gainers and backflips off the high dive at the local pool. Does that in any way change your permanent impairment rating? No, the permanent impairment rating is solely based on the objective fact that the examinee had a spinal fusion. So in that case, the visual evidence doesn't contradict your permanent impairment rating. Number two, determine if the visual evidence contradicts the applicant's statements of subjective complaints. Does it contradict the applicant's statements? Where would you find the applicant's statements? Thus would be in your QME report where they describe their symptoms and where they describe their activities of daily living. Number two, uh, does the visual evidence contradict the statements of their physical limitations? The examinee says, oh, I can't turn my head because of this pain. And if you view sub rosa videotaping that clearly shows them to be able to freely move their neck, that would be an example of contradictory visual evidence. Does the visual evidence, con is it in accordance with or does it contradict uh, the applicant's description of their activities of daily living? And I've said this before, doctors, it's my opinion that the activities of daily living assessment must be done, must be done in the face-to-face -face evaluation with the injured worker and this is one of the very reasons why. If you've done a good face-to-face -face, uh, activities of daily living assessment, you can refer back to that uh, when you view the sub rosa videotaping. Does it contradict their statements on symptom questionnaires? On symptom questionnaires they check the box that said they can't sit for more than 15 minutes and yet you observe them to sit in their car for uh, an hour. Does the visual evidence contradict the findings on physical examination? And physical examination uh, on attempting to flex the lumbar spine, the examinee uh, screams out in pain and describes pain radiating down their right lower extremity and yet in the sub rosa videotaping uh, you observe them to be able to easily bend down and pick up heavy objects from the ground. That would be an example of contradictory evidence. Now what if you see evidence on sub rosa videotaping that supports your physical exam findings? That could happen as well. The examinee bends over and oh, is demonstrated to catch himself and demonstrate pain behavior. That would be an example where the physical evidence uh, is in accordance with your findings on physical examination. Do the, does the visual evidence 
uh, agree with or does it contradict your findings on permanent impairment? Does the visual evidence contradict or is it in agreement with your opinion on the causation or the apportionment of the permanent impairment? Are the findings of the visual evidence in agreement with or do they contradict the prescribed work restrictions? So an example would be the examinee has documented work restrictions uh, of no lifting over 30 pounds and yet they're observed to be carrying a bed, uh, a box spring and mattress up uh, apartment stairs in and around tough angles uh, on sub rosa videotaping. That could be an example where the sub rosa videotaping uh, contradicts the findings of permanent impairment, especially if you've provided for permanent impairment by analogy to hernia, which, which as we know from uh, chapter 6, permanent impairment due to hernia is a permanent impairment that creates a functional limitation with lifting, precluding heavy lifting. So if you view the examinee on subrosa videotaping to be engaged in heavy lifting, that would contradict the permanent impairment rating and also uh, the permanent impairment rating. Okay, so a couple other uh, comments. When you receive sub rosa videotaping, when is sub rosa videotaping obtained? As I said, uh, sub rosa videotaping is difficult to obtain. And so it raises the question, uh, when is a good time or when, uh, when is sub rosa videotaping? Obtained. Well, the purpose of sub rosa videotaping is to attempt to prove that the applicant's statements are lies or are incorrect or are overstated. So when is the applicant engaged in making statements? When do they make statements? Well, how about at deposition? How about at deposition? When the applicant's at deposition, they sometimes spend one, two, three, even more hours providing statements about their condition uh, to both the applicant attorney and the defense attorney. And a good defense attorney will fashion their questions uh, in an effort to get the examinee to fully describe uh, their many limitations to activities of daily living and their many activities that they cannot do. And then obtain sub rosa videotaping either immediately before or immediately after the deposition to demonstrate the examinee performing exactly those activities. When else do applicants make statements? How about at the QME exam? It's a beautiful strategy to obtain videotaping of the examinee either immediately before or immediately after the QME exam and have the doctor review the videotaping and compare those with the statements that the applicant made during the qualified medical examination. Also, uh, coming to and from treatments with the primary uh, treating physician. When the applicant goes into the primary treating physician, they tell the uh, treating doctor about their condition and they make statements about their condition. And it's a perfect opportunity to obtain sub rosa videotaping to compare the visual evidence with the stated evidence as provided by the examinee. So when you get sub rosa videotaping, there's a good chance that the date of the sub rosa videotaping coincides with one of those events. It may coincide uh, with the date of a doctor's appointment. It may coincide with the date uh, of a deposition, near, near either immediately before or after a deposition. It may coincide uh, with the date of the qualified medical evaluation. For two reasons. Uh, number one, because those are the times when the employee or the injured worker makes these statements. And then number two, those are points in time when the claims examiner knows the whereabouts uh, of the examinee. They know the examinee has to go to a doctor's appointment. That's a good time uh, to uh, obtain surveillance. They know the uh, examinee has to go to a deposition. That's a good time to obtain surveillance because they know the whereabouts of the examinee. So when you get the uh, sub rosa videotaping, review the sub rosa videotaping with the medical records immediately preceding 
and immediately following the date uh, of the Sub Rosa videotaping and compare those statements with your visual observations on the Sub Rosa videotaping. Okay, doctors, uh, have a lot more to talk to you about. And uh, we're going on now over an hour here on this videotape. So I want to bring this program to a conclusion and just sort of summarize uh, these topics. And that is, uh, we're talking about Sub Rosa videotaping. And the purpose of Sub Rosa videotaping is to investigate one of the dark sides of the industry uh, that we're involved in, and that is uh, the ever presence of workers' compensation fraud. So to put this in perspective, that is, the, by the time you get Sub Rosa videotaping, it's because the claims examiner has serious concern about the validity or the authenticity of this claim. And so when you get Sub Rosa videotaping, it tells you something. It tells you that the claims examiner has devoted the time, has devoted the energy, has taken the risk and paid the money for expensive surveillance that many times has the chance of failing. It could possibly fail to produce necessary footage that causes any definitive change in the opinions or conclusions regarding this claim. But the claims examiner took a chance that it could because the claims examiner is sufficiently suspicious that in their wisdom they determine that it's cost effective to proceed in this manner. So when you get Sub Rosa videotaping you need to take it seriously and you need to scrutinize every minute uh, of the videotaping footage and run that footage through the sequence of questions uh, that I shared with you both addressing the potential red flags uh, for workers compensation fraud and then assessing uh, whether or not the visual images that you have a chance to view cause you to modify or change your opinions in any way. In other words, is the visual images consistent or contradictory with the claims, statements, and physical exam findings of the examinee? Okay doctors, so uh, I hope that helps you. Uh, this concludes uh, our three-part series on administrative issues related to workers' compensation. And uh, we've tackled some tough topics, but uh, I hope this has helped you. So this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I want to thank you for joining me on today's video. I look forward to being with you on future videos as well. And for now, I'm wishing you best of success in your career as a qualified medical evaluator.